encompasses everything. The only question is the proper response. Uh, I believe that a lot of churches in America are not churches. Okay, just th that that's pretty much clears it up. Uh, there are a lot of religious organizations that even maybe even started off as churches, but if their candlestick has been removed. Listen, if it happened in the book of Revelation, it happens today, folks. There are churches all over the place where Ichabod has been written on the door. All right? And the kingdom has nothing to do. Now, that's not to say, rarely, have I ever gone into even a, a, a wicked group of people that I haven't found a few sheep who were just literally uh, torn apart and, and unkept and unfed, but they honestly wanted God. So, so God, you know, you'll, you'll see God's people in a lot of places. But we're in a dire state right now. We really are. We really are. And there, there are a, a lot of church, for example, now, not all charismatic. I have some charismatic friends I dearly love, and they, they love the Lord. But, I mean, a lot of these TV preachers speak a lot about the kingdom. They're so far away from the kingdom that, you know, they, could, they couldn't hit it with a, with a missile, a long-range missile. Because to them, the kingdom provides a great opportunity for them to set themselves up as kings. You see. And so, yes, I mean... This is, this is the great problem, and, and this is something that will only be changed when there, is either, when there is a revival and a reformation among church leaders. The problem is not the man in the pew. The problem is the man in the pulpit. It always is. You see... And to recognize, for example, people do not understand what the church is. One of the greatest problems is we take the nation of Israel and we make it a pattern for the way church ought to be. And that's not true. The nation of Israel was basic, because here's what we do. We go, well, look in the nation of Israel, man. They were constantly rebelling, constantly in idolatry, constantly fighting against God, and they were God's people. So we look at the New Testament church over here and we go, see, there's no difference. They really are God's people. But, but the nation of Israel is not the pattern. Because in the New Covenant promises, he's constantly saying what? I'm going to do something not like when I brought the people of Israel out of Egypt. I'm going to do something different. And what's that different going to be? Well, the nation of Israel was basically an unconverted nation. Do you realize that? They were unconverted. They were God's people in the sense that He had made a covenant with a physical nation that came out of the loins of one man, Abraham. But in that gigantic group, there was only a tiny remnant of people who really knew the Lord. But when it comes to the New Testament church, He says, no, they're all going to know Me. It's not like Israel. They're all going to have a heart for me. I will be their God. They will be my people. So when you move out of that realm into what the New Testament or the Bible teaches as a whole about the church of Jesus Christ, the bride of Christ, then you start looking at this thing and say, look, you think you're a church. You've got a mass of ungodly people who are idolatrous, who no more care about the things of God than a man on the moon. And if someone came in here and preached the truth, they'd just throw him out. And then within that group, you've got a small group of embattered, just, just tore apart, unfed people who just want Christ. You see? And so that's what's going on. And that's what has to be proclaimed today. It has to be. But... Not, not with a bitter spirit, not with a critical heart, with weeping. And God can raise up a young man to say these things. He can. There are the Spurgeons, the McShanes, and other things like that. 
But it seems to me generally that before a go God will allow a man to get up and address Christianity in that way, God makes him pay his dues with years and years of suffering and thinking and working these things out. And so, let me give you, let me, let me give you young guys, because a lot of you guys feel this way, and you're right. But let me share with you something, and it's, it's not a very pretty illustration, but it's the best one I can come up with. We had Doberman pincers on our farm. And uh, sometimes we just had a couple, sometimes we had like 11. And um, something unusual about a Doberman pincer, there's just something bred into him. He just recognizes when things aren't right. You put a Doberman pincer puppy in a room and a beagle puppy in the room and you let a stranger walk in. That beagle puppy, he has no discernment whatsoever. He would, he would, he would lick the devil, he'd kiss the devil on the hand. He's just happy to be there. And he's just kind of, you know, just jumping around, happy, wants to get petted, that's all, by the stranger. That stranger walks in, and although that beagle dog is running around his legs, that Doberman pincer puppy knows something's wrong. It knows this guy, I haven't seen him before. But now the Doberman pincer puppy, what does he do? He doesn't grab the guy and toss him out the door. No, the Doberman pincer puppy tries to climb the curtains and rips them down, pees all over the couch and the carpet, and makes a mess out of everything. But he does know something's wrong. Now when he gets older and he gets more mature, he not only recognizes something's wrong, he grabs that wrong by its hind end and throws it right out the door. Now, when, when I first started preaching, I knew something was wrong. You have no idea the horrible things I have done up in a pulpit. One time I reared back with all my might and threw the Bible. I told the people, you don't want the Word of God? You don't want the Bible? Fine. And I took it and I tossed it right down the aisle. And it just flew right across to everybody, down to the back of the church. I said, there's your Bible. That's what your Bible looks like. I mean, I did a lot of things, guys. And not all of them were right. And some of them, it was right, but it was done in the wrong way. Now, don't misunderstand me. There are some times... And this is what I really have, this really bothers me about men of God. There are some times, you know, every, I know, everybody talks about Whitfield. Man, Whitfield, what a preacher. They wouldn't let Whitfield preach in their church today. You see what I'm saying? Oh, Ravenhill, Raven, they're only saying those things about Ravenhill because he's dead. And they know there's no chance Ravenhill's going to come to their church. There are times for a man to go mad, to go wild in a pulpit. And that's the problem. No one does that anymore. But when you do, you better make sure God's with you. You better know you're really <laughs> He's in agreement with you. Or you will make an absolute fool out of yourself and hurt a lot of people. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Now, some of those things needed to be done. But you have to be very, very discerning. Very discerning. Another thing, when you're preaching and you see a speck in the congregation's eye, look at the log that's in your own. And a lot of times, I can tell you, not all the time, I would, this would be a travesty to say it all the time. But among young ministers, a lot of time I can tell you what their biggest problem is by listening to their preaching. I can tell you the sin that most besets them by just listening to their preaching. Because a lot of times they will harp at the congregation about the very sin that they most struggle with. 
So I mean, it's, it's you know, guys, just pray you make through make it through this thing alive. Just pray you make it, or, or at least preaching right, so when they stone you, they stone you for a right reason. Because, you know, there are some guys who get stoned, and, and literally it's just because they're so stinking aggravating. It's not because they're biblical. And so you have to be very careful. What time is it? It's 7 o'clock. Okay. Well, let's take a small...